All right, folks, Rich Folley here, PBS Book View Now. We're at AWP 2017. AWP, the Association of Writers and Writers Programs. Amazing gathering, lots of energy here. And I'm sitting right now with Rakesh Satyal, yep. the author of No One Can Pronounce My Name. I butchered it probably, No, didn't you, I? you pronounced it, okay. so thank <laughs> you. <good. Yeah. laughs> no one can pronounce my name. You're also the author of Blue Boy, which won a Lambda Literary Award, That's right. your yeah. fast book, and you work in the publishing industry. I do, yeah. You just talked that you work for Atria Publishing. That's right. And you are here in a variety of different roles. That's right, yeah. Your book comes out in May. There's a lot of attention being paid to it. It's a wonderful story about uh, a family that comes from India yep. and moves after a family tragedy, yep. and that sort of multi-generational story too of two different generations uh, adapting to life in the United States. Yeah. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about how it all came about for you. You're yeah. a Cincinnati, we were just talking I'm from earlier. Cincinnati, outside. that's right. You're from Cincinnati. When did your family first come to the United States? Uh, my parents immigrated uh, in 1970, 70, 72, kind of in stages, I should say. And uh, we were uh, talking about this, that they both actually went to Miami of Ohio. Uh, they're both alumni of that wonderful school. I am too. Yeah, I'm exactly. Too. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I obviously they're, experience of immigration has been at the forefront of my mind and in my work. Blue Boy focused mainly on a 12-year-old boy who was kind of going through various issues of identity and gender identity and sexuality. And so when I was writing this book, I kind of almost went a, generation, a couple of generations beyond that to look at the people who were adults, basically, to that kind of child. Yeah. yeah, what I found really interesting about No One Can Pronounce My Name is the idea of the differences in the assimilation process between the two generations. And yeah. like the process that, that the mother goes through right. and the mothers in, in this case yeah. because there's two and then right. the, the sort of the, the changes that happen between that and the sons yep. and, the, and the other family members. Uh, I'm interested in from your own perspective about that difference in the, inside the household and growing up. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my, I, I love to tell people that my parents were, almost, were very, very anomalous for immigrants because uh, they actually had a love marriage not an arranged marriage, which was, which was not something that was all that common in their generation. And I think that had some bearing on my brothers and me because we, they were very supportive and progressive for Indian parents in general. And they encouraged us to explore the arts and to explore our creativity. And they never, never stopped me from ever doing that. I always like to tell people, the one thing I was allowed to spend as much money I wanted on in terms of my allowance was books. My mom, if I went to a bookstore, she was like, buy whatever you want. Yeah, and that was very family. Important. Exactly. <laughs> so, so I think that was something that, that's really informed my work, the idea that there are these differences in generations. It's how you negotiate them that changes the outcome of how, of how the kids grow up. Yeah. yeah. The, the story revolves around a number of different characters, but Harit Singha yeah. and his sister Swati. Yeah. There's a tragedy. We won't tell all the details of the right, story, right. but, but the, it's about him recognizing slowly uh, his own gender, and you're kind of coming to terms with right. his own gender questions, that he's gay, right. and having to sort of deal with that in the confines of an Indian family where yeah. there are arranged marriages and That's things. Right. But when he came here, he sort of avoided that. That was a relief. Can you talk about just being an Indian person and having to come to terms with the idea and something that is sort of not normal in the Indian culture to kind of be out and loud? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what, what I explored, especially in the first book and then continued in this book, was the idea that um, when you grow up in that culture, a lot of the iconography, for example, seems very gender ambiguous. And so you look at it and you think, what is this disconnect between what I'm seeing and then what I'm being told by people? And so in the book, I, I, the, this character actually came from a, a real life person I had met where he was a man in his mid 40s who was unmarried and lived with his mother. And I just heard everybody talking as if he were gay, not knowing the issue, the, the actual answer to that question, you know? And so that really stuck with me because I was like, there's this whole narrative people are building around this person, but we don't know what his life is like at all. And so that really was my, my way of getting into the book and writing about it. And I think negotiating those questions in the Indian community, I mean, I, uh, I've seen my position as somebody who is an author who writes as being helpful to the community in which I grew up because my parents' friends all the Indian families they knew growing up now know me, and they now know this story, and they've been incredibly supportive. But they might not necessarily have known that story if I hadn't written it or talked about it. And I think that's made all of our lives better. Yeah. So I think that's that's what I that's why I write what I write and why that becomes the central theme in the book. And yeah. you're gay, and you you just told me that you've been recently married. Yes, yeah. Um, 
can you tell me about the, how your own family sort of responded to that? It sounds like you came from a literary family. Yeah, this yeah. is a group that married for love. I, I have a sense that they That's probably right. were completely supportive, but others maybe um, kind of coming to terms with who you are as a person. I, 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 you know, they were incredibly supportive. And what we did was we, um, uh, my now husband and I have been together for four and a half years, and we looked at each other after the election in particular, to be honest, and just said, you know what, we want to pay a tribute to the administration that recognized us, that supported us, that made this possible. And so we told just, I have a fraternal twin brother who lives in New York. He was our, the only person who knew, he's our witness. And we went and, and it was wonderful. I mean, we, it was just our testament to the fact that we believe in being able to do this. And we believe in our relationship and we believe in having certain rights. And I think our community has been incredibly supportive because again, that's, you know, you were saying earlier that books are not just books, they're the people behind the books. They're the people who support the books, that buy the books, that read them, that talk about them. And that's true of civil rights. It's, the civil rights are not just some law put in, that, that's enacted. It's the people who get those rights, who live them and believe them and, and get to live because of them. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, that, uh, having our community support that and seeing that we were the people putting that in practice was educational for them and us. Mm -hmm. So it's been wonderful. Yeah. So in the past, there was, when, when this was being ruled by states, yeah. and some states would have allow gay marriage, people would rush in and get married with yeah. the fear that it could be taken away at any right. point. Um, and then Obergefell, and then you have the Supreme Court decision, right. and it's the law of the land, right. and suddenly it feels safe again. As you said, during the last administration, all of a sudden you wonder, like, what is safe? What does safe actually mean in right. terms of having one's rights and claiming one's position right. and, and feeling like you're... These civil rights are yours for good. That's right. Can you talk a little bit about, in terms of the way you feel as a married gay man, about the permanence of that and about what you need to do to sort of make sure that you don't ever have to go backwards? Uh, you know, it's, it's holding fast to... I know this of myself. You know, I, I think I explored this in my work a great deal, which is that there are certain truths people know about themselves, whether they acknowledge it or not. But once they come to that, they never unlearn that experience. And so I... You know, we look at John, my husband and I look at each other and we just think, you know, this is not going to change. Like, we are who we are. We've known that since we met each other. We believe these things and nobody's going to, nobody can take that belief away. You know, that's, and so it is scary. I mean, we're living in a time where we worry about what might be repealed or what might change, but we, in this moment, it's, and that's important for people to do, that's a form of self care to tell yourself, these are the things that I believe. It will never change that I believed them. You know, it will never change that I said this to myself, that I acknowledged it. And other people can come in and say what they want to say, but we acknowledge that and we said it and we were here. You know, we were here, we were queer, get used to it. Uh, and, but I, that's true. You know, it's, it's being able to acknowledge that and say that. And one of the great gifts as a writer is that you write it down and there it is. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that's not going to change either. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, uh, when I talk to you now, you live out loud and there's like, uh, there's like an excitement and energy right. to your... The, one of the interesting things about the characters that I read them is so much of their life is internal. They're yeah. holding things in. And in fact, that leads to all sorts of misunderstandings because right. people aren't as communicative. They're trying to figure things out by themselves oftentimes and afraid to necessarily talk about it. Your son, um, when, you're, when Harid is talking to his mother, yeah. he longs to be able to have this conversation with her. And for whatever reason, they're not communicating. Yes. There's, a, there's a whole story behind that. Um, that idea of having to sort of discover all these things without that river of communication. Yeah. That, that sounds so challenging. It is challenging. I mean, the, 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 I really appreciate your mentioning that because so much of the book is subtext. You know, that is the idea of exactly the conversations people should be having but aren't having. And I, I think that's a very essential component of the queer experience, frankly. The idea that you learn from an early age, unfortunately, to police yourself in terms of what kind of conversation you're having and what you're divulging and what you're telling people and what you're not telling them. And so that is a very central theme of the book. And, and not just that interaction, but as you, as you noted, in, with other characters, because yeah. there are romantic misunderstandings, there are educational misunderstandings, there are misunderstandings with writers. I mean, there's a whole part of the book that's very much focused on writing. And so I, I think that is the, the element I was looking for to elevate the narrative of the book, which was to say, there's one conversation happening and at any point in the book, I hope that you realize that 
it's probably not the conversation that people verbally should be having, are having, but they should be having. Right. Yeah, now it's, yeah. it's interesting that you reveal, I mean, we get to know these characters, so we're sort of ho hovering over and being able to understand where these misunderstandings are happening, all for a couple that you reveal and give us these big sort of shock moments. Yeah. But at the same time, as you're, uh, you, you, you write about these things, the great comedic effect, you use comedy really effectively, and the idea of mixing comedy with literary fiction and, and sort yeah. of as a propulsive element to the books, um, I'm really interested in because it lightens it and yet at the same time it doesn't detract from the seriousness of your messages. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I see that as a very central part of my writing, which is that comedy is, a, is it's truly a vessel. You know, com comedy is truth. You know, the idea, that no comedy actually works unless there's, a, there's truth in it. You know, and so for me, I, I, I think, I, I I mentioned that you know the book at one point was called a sense of humor. I, I I thought of it as being called a sense of humor. The reason why I thought of it that way was because people have a tendency to look at what they deem you know ethnic literature as being really wistful and sort of world weary, and they don't necessarily think of it as being funny. But the truth is, so much of the ethnic experience in this country, of the immigrant experience in this country, is funny, yeah, it, intentionally and unintentionally. So for me, I thought. I want to subvert what people think this genre is. You know, I want them to come to this and say, this actually is funny and these situations are funny, but something very serious is happening. I mean, you, you know this with the, with the relationship between Hirth and his mother, it's a very sad circumstance that they're in. But the, finding the comedy in that is the way that you make people understand why from a singular perspective, it, may, it means something. Right. So, and and my, I should know, my older brother, Rajiv, Sathyal, is a stand-up comic, that's his, that's his that's his living and he has had a very wonderful successful career and so comedy is is literally part of our family it's a very important part of our family yeah, yeah. In, the, in the minute or so that we have yeah, left yeah. um the idea of ethnic literature there's this idea that like you're writing to a certain audience but we're seeing now people flooding into these these genres these these yeah. other cultures you're learning about a culture at the same time you're reading a, a great work of fiction and it's sort of the ethnic element sort yeah, of melts away right. as you get into the story. But it is more universal now. What are your thoughts about sort of the future of ethnic literature, whether it's Africans or Indians or other cultures, well, I, I Caribbean? Think, I, I, well, we've seen, I mean, TV has become the real talking point here because we've seen such wonderful diversification of storytelling in television. And I think what it is, is it's actually making TV writers better and it's making writers of fiction better at the same time. So I think, I think what it is is that, you know, is what you were noting earlier, the pendulum may swing back and forth in terms of what this country puts into law, but we're all here and we're all telling these stories and that's not going to change. You yeah. know? And, and so I, I, AWP is the great example of people coming together to tell these stories and support yeah. each other. So, well, they yeah. sure have. And yeah. I'm, I'm very thankful that you stopped by. No one can pronounce my name. Rakesh Satyal, also the author of Blue Boy. Really wonderful. Excited for May when this book Thank comes out. Yeah. And to see everyone grab onto this book. In the meantime, thanks for being Thank with us at so AWP. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was Thank great you. fun. Yeah.